Hey, Cav Troopers and uh, future scout pilots, Brundus here. Uh, what I'd like to do today is just kind of give you a intro to the KW and maybe a, a cockpit orientation uh, and go over some of the switches, circuit breakers, what's what in the cockpit uh, to give you some insight into why we do things the way we did and uh, why certain switches are set the way they are, etc. And maybe some... Uh, uh, detail on the kind of the the reasoning behind the way certain things operate the way they do. Now this is going to be kind of a long video. Um, it is not a, a uh, quick run-up video. Uh, this is for those of you that want the excruciating detail uh, and some kind of some of the backstory. Uh, so if you're looking for a quickie run-up video, that'll be in a in a different forum. So real quick, just a bit about me. Um, I flew the KW from uh, 1998 to 2014, uh, right before they went away. In fact, I flew a batch of them from Fort Rucker, where I was stationed at the time, uh, down to Arizona to be put in the boneyard. So that was kind of a sad day. At any rate, um, I progressed throughout my career, starting off uh, as a PI, uh, or a um, kind of a first year uh, guy out of flight school and then you progress to pilot and command I did that uh, did that for about four years and then I chose to go to the uh, instructor pilot or standardization route um, did that in 2002 and then uh, flew them in Germany at uh, in Schweinfurt uh, deployed to Iraq from there um, and then a couple of subsequent assignments, I went and taught at Fort Rucker as an instructor at the schoolhouse, creating new 58D pilots. And then I went to Fort Bragg uh, towards uh, the end of the of the aughts, of the tens, um, where I progressed from an IP to what's called a senior instructor pilot, which is kind of the senior guy at the company or troop level, troops in, in the CAV. Um, and then uh, on up to a squadron standardization pilot, which is kind of the uh, chief IP, I guess if you want to call it that, of a, a squadron, and from there to uh, various other jobs uh, throughout the Army. So um, obviously not flying these anymore, but they were a hell of a lot of fun to fly. Uh, many of you know the backstory of the KW. It's been around for a long time. Uh, the role of the Kiowa Warrior um, and cavalry in general is in the counter reconnaissance fight. So doctrinally what the cavalry cavalry does is uh, they're the eyes and ears of the commander. Um, so the when you boil it down to the doctrinal fight, meaning force on force, which is not what we've been doing for the last 19 years, is the cavalry provides uh, reaction time and early warning and seeks to counter the enemy's uh, reconnaissance and security forces from being able to influence our own main body. So Kiowa does that by hopefully finding the enemy first and then uh, has a, a limited capability to uh, engage with autonomous weapons, but primarily uh, what we by far prefer to do is call in fires uh, and just provide the commander with information so that he can make decisions based on where to uh, meet or delay the enemy with his own forces. So enough about that. Um, like I said, what I'll do today is kind of go through a cockpit orientation. I'll go through uh, just what everything is in the cockpit and then uh, maybe we'll start a uh, go through a detailed run-up procedure where I'll set all the switches and explain what they do. Um, and then we'll do a more rapid or real-time run-up in a different video. So this will be by no means a real-time uh, video. Um, so what you'll get is just a lot of uh, excruciating detail. So uh, just an orientation to the cockpit here. Uh, what you see in front of you um, is kind of typical for the coin fight. Uh, the M4s, I'll just start with those. So uh, obviously those are not a, a primary weapon system. We uh, use those as personal security uh, in the event that you are forced down in enemy territory. That's really what they're for. So all 
air crews have a self-protection uh, personal weapon of some sort. Ours are stowed on the dash because there's really no other, no other place to put them. Um, what we did end up using them for in a lot of cases was an escalation of force. So when we are searching for um, in the in the coin fight or the counterinsurgency fight, we find somebody that's potentially doing something they shouldn't be doing, like in placing IEDs or doing something else suspicious. Uh, and the the rules of engagement maybe don't necessarily allow uh, the use of lethal, lethal force uh, right off the bat. And M4 is can be a tool to um, indicate a to an insurgent that hey uh, maybe we think you're doing what you shouldn't be doing um, you can fire some warning shots etc now I don't want to go into too much detail there because it's quite complicated with the rules of engagement uh, but just suffice to know that uh, the M4s we did use them regularly sometimes uh, for self-protection um, sometimes as an escalation of force when 50 cal or rockets or hellfire are not appropriate, etc. But anyway, they're there for our use and we did use them. You also see the, the grenade up on the dash there. By the way, the dashboard uh, kind of was a catch-all. We threw anything and everything up on the dashboard. So here you see a water bottle. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of space up there where we would throw knee boards and map products and most importantly what we call pogey bait, which are snacks, beef jerky, sunflower seeds, candy bars, um, soft drinks, etc. Everything got tossed up on the dashboard up there. And if you go to the left seat side, um, you can see right here there's, there's a, uh, probably a checklist right there. Um, there's actually an indentation. Uh, I can't look around the M4 right now, but there's a, a hole in the dash right there uh, underneath the M4 where you can stash a bunch more stuff like a logbook, etc. At any rate, just know that we use the dash to <laughs> kind of store everything that we wanted to have handy throughout the flight. So these things are, are smoke grenades. So typically we'd have five or six of these um, stuck up on the dash, and then we'd clip some up here. Uh, They'd be some some guys like to clip them um, on the side here, so they just kind of depending on where it was convenient for the guy to have them. We would use these to mark locations that we wanted to call attention to. So again, we use these quite regularly as well. So they were tossed out to mark a location of a found IED or a cache site or or whatever the case may be. Um, all right then. Moving around to the rest of the cockpit, it's a it's a two place cockpit. Uh, both sets of controls have equal function as far as controlling the helicopter. So pedals, cyclic, and collective both work the same way. The right seat side is what's typically known as the pilot side. This is primarily concerned with controlling the aircraft, and there's a lot more um, electrical stuff on the collective control head and the cyclic control head uh, that can turn to pertains to uh, the pilot being able to use the radios and switch uh, view screens without taking his hands off the controls. Um, it should be known that uh, both guys in the Kiowa are rated aviators and pretty interchangeable. So if uh, one guy was flying right seat one day, they if they were crewed up again later on in the week or whatever, they'd probably switch seats. Um, so they're both equally uh, capable. Um, it just depends on what you want to do that day. The left seat side is the uh, the CPG co-pilot gunner, or alternately known as the CPO co-pilot observer. So this crew station is primarily concerned with running the MMS, the mast mounted sight, the mission equipment, setting up the weapons, uh, the nav system, radios, etc. So this is really, truthfully, where the uh, money is made as far as the mission aspects and just as a kind of as a cultural or technique thing um, a lot of times you would have the air mission commander sit in the left seat in the trail aircraft in the coin fight where you have a team of two um, because he's primarily concerned with uh, running the overall mission and keeping situational awareness of um, all the aspects of the mission that are going on the trail uh, aircraft would typically fly up high uh, and the lead aircraft, what we call the scout in the in the two 
uh, aircraft team configuration would be down low actually looking for stuff. Um, so you'd have the experienced guy uh, as far as aviating the aircraft sitting in the right seat. You might have a more junior guy sitting in the left learning the mission, learning his job, etc. cetera. Um, whereas in the trail aircraft, the air mission commander would be sitting in the left seat and another uh, pilot would be sitting in a right just flying the aircraft. His primary duty is to cover lead at all times, never lose sight of him, always be prepared and in a position to rapidly um, come to the assistance of the lead aircraft if he ever came under fire. So putting down suppressive fires if he observed anybody shooting at the lead aircraft, etc. Again, the, the guy in the left seat is primarily concerned with talking on the radios, coordinating the mission, talking to other units, talking to other aircraft, etc. Switchology-wise, the, the cyclic here has switches that are um, primarily set up to control the function of the MMS. Uh, the the um, controls and switches on the left side, which I won't get into in quite as much detail today, uh, versus the right seat, all of these pertain to uh, the functioning of the weapons, uh, the video equipment, the sighting equipment, the laser rangefinder designator, and the MMS, etc. All right, going back to the right. Um, some other things you see up in front of you here. This is called, so there's one of these uh, off, hanging off the, uh, the dashboard on each crew station. This is the CABS, the Cockpit Airbag System. Uh, we also have them uh, on the side here. You can see this fabric that goes up the A-pillar. Um, this is all also part of the cabs or cockpit airbag system. So this is a, a fabric uh, pillow or pouch basically inside of which is an airbag, um, which is activated the same way that your car airbags are activated. Uh, they inflate in the event of a, of a crash sequence. And this thing right here is a clamshell. So the, the upper portion would pop up and the lower portion would pop down and out in front of your face would pop out a, a giant airbag. I've never personally had one deploy uh, in front of me, um, thankfully, um, but I know in some cases that uh, that they have worked. Uh, as far as I know, we were the only aircraft to have a cockpit airbag system, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, that the yellow handle you see there on the a, on the A pillar is the uh, door release mechanism. So that's a real simple, just hinge. Um, both sides have them, so you can when the doors are installed. You can grab that handle and pull it down, and the door will just fall off. Um, that's all that is. This component right here in the center is the CMOS, the Common Missile Warning System control control head. Uh, I'll go over that in more detail during the uh, the switches portion of this. Uh, in the center, for terminology, that is the RFD, the Remote Frequency Display, and it uh, displays what radios you're using and what frequencies are, are uh, being used. Moving to the right of that is the VSI, the Vertical Scales Instrument, and then the MFDs, Multi-Function Displays. They're the same on the left and right side, and they display everything pertaining to uh, what's going on in the cockpit. This is the clock. Uh, we used to have an analog old school clock. Now they're uh, digital and run on battery power, so there's no indication with no battery. Uh, that is the APR39 radar warning receiver um, control head and indicator. So that will show you where threat detection is occurring, uh, radar threats that is, um, and also the AVR2 uh, laser detection set uh, is tied into this, so it will also display when you are being lased for a laser-guided weapon. will all show up right here. There's also a audio component associated with this, so uh, when the APR39 is functioning, you get audio indications in the form of a voice that tells you uh, radar searching, tracking, launch, etc. Uh, that right there is the uh, warning light for the cabin heater, uh, and then Beneath it is the um, push button, not illuminated now because we're not on battery power, uh, for the engine barrier filter uh, bypass motor. So when you press that, uh, the engine filter is bypassed, and you would use that if the filter ever became clogged and you got a warning indication uh, that the engine couldn't get enough air, you would want to press that button, and uh, the engine would 
suck unfiltered air. I'll talk about that more as we go through the checklist. Finally, there's the mag compass, which is uh, a compass that you would find anywhere. Uh, it's full of fluid, and that's part of the uh, run-up checklist as well. This is the MFD aux control panel, which you have right there. That little white ball is the turn and slip indicator, which um, is our primary instrument for knowing that we're in trim and a good pilot is always in trim when he's making turns, etc. Uh, these switches are for control. Uh, you can move your, your pitch and roll indications on your MFD when you have your flight instruments displayed. Moving along to the standby flight instruments, so from uh, right to left, this is our standby altimeter, standby attitude indicator, and standby airspeed indicator. These are functioning, uh, will function normally when power is applied, uh, and in case the MFDs fail, you could use these uh, to fly off of. All right, this is called the MPD, the multi-parameter display, and uh, just from left to right, uh, it shows transmission pressure and temperature, engine pressure and temperature, fuel quantity, and then NG is the uh, gas produce, producer section of the of the turbine. Um, so what you'll see there is a, a, a vertical scale indicating uh, green, yellow, and red, you know, where you are as far as operating RPMs, and then, then uh, it'll also show that backed up by uh, a digital display. So the gas producer, there's two sections of the turbine. The gas producer or the N1 section, otherwise known as the N1 section, and the power turbine, NP, otherwise known as the N2 section. So the gas producer takes fuel, air, um, and spark and creates combustion, and that combustion creates the expanding gases which then pass out of the combustion section across the power turbine blades which utilize the hot gases produced by the gas producer section uh, to produce power, which in turn drives the rotor, the tail rotor, um, all the power generating equipment, etc. So here on the, uh, the VSI vertical scale instrument, um, we have rotor RPM, NR, and NP is the power turbine RPM. So in helicopters, you generally have three speeds, N1, N2, uh, otherwise known as NG, and NP, uh, and NR, which is uh, rotor RPM. Anytime you see an N, it uh, has to do with some sort of operating parameter of the engine, usually in RPMs. So NR and MP are generally always need to match um, at 100%. So NP, power turbine, always drives NR. So if your NP is at 100%, your, your uh, rotor should be at 100%. Now these are all normalized to, you know, just percentages, uh, but in the old days, this would be called your dual tack. So you would have a needle, and those one needle indicating uh, the power turbine speed and the other needle indicating the rotor speed, and they should always be matched. When you get what we call a, a split in the needles, that means you may have had a, an engine power loss, and your power turbine uh, will be decreasing, while if hopefully if you're in good auto rotation, your NR will remain at 100% or slightly greater than 100%. Um, anyways, a split in the needles or a split in these RPMs indicates that something is going radically wrong. Um, going back to this, you got some various uh, features you can select there. So we would use this uh, during the start sequence. Um, this is mislabeled. This should be NR and MP, so we're going to fix that uh, prior to release. But then you can use this little knob here to select which ones of these things you want displayed here. So fuel quantity and engine torque percentage. Uh, it's important to note in the KW you have two torque readings. There's engine torque and then there's mast torque. So they're kind of two different things. It's a little bit complicated to get into it, but just know that uh, the engine torque is driven off of oil pressure uh, and it kind of has to do with uh, the operating health of the engine. Um, and the mast torque is a measure of the mechanical stress on the transmission. Um, and that's the primary. So what's displayed up here on the torque instrument is mast torque. Um, and that's a little bit different than, a lot, than some other helicopters uh, in other services who have either blended torques or uh, it just depends on how you want to display it. Above 40 knots, engine torque 
kind of normalizes with mass torque and the software blends them together so what you see above 40 knots is a is a combined or averaged readout of engine torque and mass torque um, and below 40 knots uh, they'll actually be split the reason that is is because the uh, so first of all the engine in the in the Kiowa Warrior can produce 650 shaft horsepower the transmission is only rated to accept 550 horsepower that would be hundred percent mass torque the surplus um, if you're at 100% mass torque, could still be used to drive the tail rotor, etc. So you, you generally always have a surplus of engine power. You will, and what engine power equates to is heat. So at a 100% engine torque, you would not necessarily be at a mechanical limitation. You would be at a temperature limitation. So again, it, it, it's kind of deep and complicated on how these things work, but know that in the Kiowa Warrior generally we were not engine limited we were either weight limited or uh, mechanical stress on the engine on the uh, transmission limited um, and you usually had a surplus of engine power available which means that performance wise we could operate with some degree of safety margin before the engine reached critical limits as far as either internal stresses or temperature performance there's cases where that's not necessarily true. The higher and hotter you go, for instance, the mountains of Afghanistan, the air is thinner, it's much hotter. Uh, you may run out of engine performance before you reach a mechanical stress limit on your transmission. Again, it's kind of deep and it varies from location to location. All right, moving down from the MPD, we have the MFK, the multi-function keyboard. So this is where all data entry occurs. Uh, it's a terrible design. It's down by, so most of the time the left seater would be punching in whatever needs to be punched in here, uh, typing messages, entering data into the weapon system, etc. Uh, you can't see it because it's behind your knee. Uh, if you move your knee, you bump the cyclic, you're screwing the other guy up. It's just not in a good location. It's a very cramped cockpit. We did the best we could. It's also not QWERTY. So trying to remember where the stupid keys are was sometimes hard. Um, the clear buttons used a lot. So when you are entering data into the CDS or the control display system, um, you'll use the clear button a lot. So you'll enter something in and hit enter, or when you bring something up, it will already have information in it. And you just hit clear and then you start entering new information. Your IFF is for your transponder. So you can hit that and it will um, send out a, uh, a response manually. Um, and your ident is also for your transponder where it just sends out a ping. So you wouldn't use that in um, combat so much, but let's say you're flying stateside and ATC asks you to ident, you would hit the ident key right there. Um, on the MFK is the uh, emergency zero eyes uh, and the emergency, let me back up. So these are two safety covers. Underneath are two switches. When you flip that switch, the function is activated. This is the emergency uh, key. So when you flip that switch underneath it, what happens is uh, the software configures each one of the radios uh, to go to guard. So uh, UHF guard 243 nothing would be selected VHF would be 121.5 FM I can't remember it uh, anyway all the all the radios are configured to the emergency frequency um, the JVMF or the joint variable message format which is kind of our digital text messaging system where you can send digital information is automatically configured to send an emergency location message so it's a distress text that says hey something's wrong here's my last known location and it goes out uh, also it sets your transponder to 7700 for emergency so uh, when you flip that switch all kinds of things you lose the radios you were talking on and they all go to the emergency frequency so in a lot of cases you wouldn't even want to use this because you would always want to have your wingman or the ground force on the radios that you were already talking on so when you flip this switch 
you lose all that and you are no longer talking to the people you were talking to. Now you're just up on the emergency frequencies, which there may or may not be somebody there to, to talk to you. The zero eyes switch um, destructively zero eyes the ComSec equipment and some of the radios. So when you open that and you flip that switch, bad things happen to the radios as a security feature, which zero eyes them and, and then um, it destructively zero eyes portions of the control display system or the aircraft software and some of the radios. So you better really be sure that you want to do that when you use that switch. I've never used it. I've never known anybody to use it. Um, I know a couple guys that have been shot down. I don't remember whether they flipped that switch or not. This is probably the most important switch in the aircraft, the recall acknowledge switch. Everything you do uh, for messages, caution warnings, etc., that come up uh, on as audios and flags on your MFDs, you will acknowledge. Sorry, you you press down. It's a spring-loaded three-position switch. It always goes back to the center. Uh, when you have an audio come up telling you, "Hey, pay attention to something in the aircraft," you acknowledge it. The audio turns off. Um, if you continue to acknowledge it. If you have, say, 15 messages, it will just cycle through each of those messages. And then if you want to read them later, you would recall them to bring them back on your screens. I'll go over the uh, caution warning system in the aircraft real quick. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll wait till we have some power applied just so you can uh, correlate it with seeing something on, on the screen. Next to the MFK is the SCAS control panel, the Stability and Control Augmentation System. So many of you are going to ask, well, is it an autopilot? How does it work? How much control does it have? It is not an autopilot. SCAS uh, is a method um, to smooth out uh, unwanted control inputs, uh, maybe due to winds or unintended uh, burbles in the air, etc. So there's several systems in the aircraft, gyros, GPS, etc., that work together to help the aircraft know where it is at all times, what attitude it's in, it has to, it drives how the weapons work, the nav system work. All of these things are tied to the EGI, the embedded um, gyro inertial system. What SCAS does is it reads the position of all the flight controls, the pedals, the cyclic, and the collective, and it compares those to what is happening, to what it's sensing as far as movements. If the movements don't correlate to where what the controls are doing, then those are unwanted control or unwanted inputs into the movement of the aircraft. For instance, winds. The SCAS can then counteract and make up to 10% control authority uh, counter movements to smooth out the rotor system, smooth out unwanted um, aircraft burbles, etc. So it makes it more pleasant to fly. It, it is not an autopilot. You cannot hit a button and the aircraft will just stay where it's at, etc. Force trim is just a, it's a magnetic brake on the flight controls. So when you turn force trim on, basically it's just a magnet holding the flight controls in the position that you have it set at. Force trim goes along with the button on the cyclic, when you press that button and force trim is on, it interrupts that force trim. So uh, it's technique. Most Kiowa pilots did not fly with force trim engaged during flight uh, because, quite honestly, it's somewhat annoying. Um, other Army aircraft, it is prohibited to turn force trim off. For instance, the Apache, which I now fly. Uh, you have to fly with the force trim, and when you want... Now, force trim does not prevent you from moving the controls. It just makes it... There's like a force gradient on it. So you can push against it, and you can still push through it. But for me, having grown up and learning to fly the Kiowa, where we did not fly with force trim, it's annoying to have something pushing back against me. Some guys did like to have it on, because uh, in combat... Uh, if you got shot, it's a safety measure. So what happens in a helicopter, typically, if you took your hands off the cyclic, uh, control forces aerodynamically would cause the rotor system to just pitch forward immediately. So there's always you're always holding a little bit of back pressure on the cyclic as you're flying. Uh, if you were to just let go of it, that stick would just 
move forward and you would dive towards the ground within a split second. With force trim on, if you were to be suddenly incapacitated, for instance, you took a bullet to the head and slumped over dead, your co-pilot probably would not have enough time to react to save the aircraft uh, from an unusual attitude. Um, not to mention you're probably slumped against the controls and pushing it, you know, pushing back against them a little bit uh, as dead weight. So the force trim will prevent that sudden and rapid um, uh, slack in the flight controls. So in a sense, it's a safety measure. Some guys would use it in that case. So if you want to make a rapid maneuver, you would press the force trim interrupt, make your control input, and then release it when you are where you want to be. Alternately, um, a lot of guys just dialed in the friction on their, so I don't know if you can see the knob down there. At the, there's, a, there's a rotary knob down here next to the cyclic, and there's another one that would be here underneath the collective that where you could just dial in a certain amount of mechanical friction on the controls to provide some force resistance. Um, and that is totally user preference. So if you were to take all the frictions off, this thing would be a wet noodle. And if you were to let go of it, it would just flop forward. With a user-defined amount of... Uh, friction put on the controls, you could put in enough so that there is some resistance felt uh, as if you were pushing through a little bit of sand or something when you put that force, that uh, that friction on. That's the way I prefer to do it. Um, younger guys typically like the, the wet noodle. Uh, the more experience you get, the more friction you like to dial in. Um, that's particularly key for using the collective, you put in enough friction so that when you let go of the collective, it just stays where it's at. Um, and that's because you want to be predictable. Every time you move the collective, uh, you're changing the power of the aircraft, which changes the torque, which changes your yaw, which changes everything. So precision, um, high skill flying all starts with the collective where you set a certain power in, and then don't change it and you make other adjustments with pedals or cyclic. That's not to say that this isn't being moved all the time in flight. It is, but let's say if you're trying to keep uh, a constant rate of descent on a precision uh, instrument approach, um, you would set a descent power on your collective and hopefully not touch that lever again and make all other corrections with cyclic. Um, anyway, that's kind of getting in the weeds. Uh, what else can I talk about here? Moving below the MFK, you have the ACP, the Armament Control Panel. So this is the master panel, as I'm sure many of you uh, have similar things in the aircraft that you fly in DCS. This uh, energizes the weapon systems. Uh, you go from off to a standby or energized state, and then armed is pretty, pretty obvious. Uh, the left and right jettison uh, will punch off whatever stores are on the UWP or the universal weapons pylons on the outside. Uh, it's key to note that if you have a gun installed, that does not jettison because the cable that provides power to the gun motor uh, is not a quick release cable. Uh, so there are no jettison squibs on the ejector rack when the gun is installed, so it cannot be jettisoned. Hellfire, rocket pod, and when, the, when we did have ATAS, those were jettisonable. So when you Put those covers up and you hit those switches the squibs would would bust and they would kick those off the uh the gun switch uh this is exclusive to when you have a 50 cal installed it's a three position switch so the armed position um let me start with safe so in the safe position the bolt of the gun is pulled to the rear which means the breech is open um, that would be uh, for ground operations typically. This only works when you put power to the system. So you can use, uh, you can energize the bolt retract motor um, or arm and safe it only when you have the master switch either in standby or armed. With a, when it's off, there's no power in the system. So when you go from safe to armed, you're sending a signal to the bolt retract motor to go ahead and let the bolt come forward and you'll hear it chunk into place as it cycles around and, and loads around into the chamber. 
The recock position is a momentary three-way. So if you had a malfunction um, and there was a misfeed or, or double feed or whatever, you could just hit recock and that commands the bolt retract motor to bring the bolt to the rear, hopefully extract the bad round, kick it overboard, and cycle another one. Now, if we have a gun installed and we're operating in an austere environment, which tonight we are on concrete, so there's not a lot of dust and, and blowing debris, uh, but let's say we were in a forward deployed environment where there is a lot of dust and debris, on pre-flight as a technique, what we would do is um, put power to the to the system and before gun uh, rounds are loaded in the chute, um, we would go ahead and bring the switch to the armed position and then turn the battery back off. So what you have in that case uh, is the bolt in the closed or forward or in battery position so that when the battery is turned on, uh, the gun retract motor or the bolt retract motor reads that armed status and it will not retract the bolt to open it. And that helps you keep dust and debris out of the breach while you're just flying around before you're ready to take off. Once you are ready, uh, you would just hit recock and it would open the bolt, feed around, close the bolt, and now you are armed. And keep in mind, all this has to be done with power applied to the system. Okay. Below that, this is kind of a key one. Uh, this is our uh, communication select control panel. So there's two of these. Uh, the pilot has his and the co-pilot has his right here. Okay. Um, what this is for is controlling all your radios. And it may be easier to show you this from the left seat. Go ahead and raise my collective and this is pretty typical you can't see these things with with some of the uh with how small the cockpit is um so this controls all the functions of the radio however the functioning on the left and right seat is different so our master volume knob that's pretty pretty uh self-explanatory each one of these pins one through five is for radio one through five and again on the rfd uh, when there's power applied you would see radios one through five displayed here. Radio one is FM number one. Radio two is UHF. Radio three is VHF. Radio four used to be high frequency, now no longer used, repurposed to SATCOM, um, which goes up to a satellite. It's a digital communication radio. And then radio number five is FM number two. So army speak. We use FM radios. All ground units, uh, typically, uh, there are some specialized ones like uh, special forces that have embedded JTACs that have UHF radios to talk to their Air, Air Force aircraft. The Army operates on FM. Um, so whenever we are talking to a ground force, we're talking on either FM1 or FM2. Typically, for secure communications, um, so all these radios have the ability to be secure. The FM radios had their own internal security. Uh, and then we had two external components called a KY-58 that we could uh, use to encrypt the UHF and the VHF. Anyway, each one of these buttons um, is the independent volume and listening feature for radios one through five. So this is master volume. And these buttons are all out right now. I'm going to go ahead and push them in. In order to hear that radio, the button has to be pushed in, and then you can independently adjust the volume on each one of those radios. Um, as a technique, what we would do uh, is pull radio number four, and at night, when the pilot can't necessarily look down to see which one of these knobs he's manipulating, just like on your keyboard on your, uh, what is it, the F and the J keys, where you have that little nub that you can feel uh, where your hands are placed, you can reach down, you can feel that upraised pin on, on this row of buttons, and you'll know that radios one through three are to the left of it and radio five. Uh, typically, the right seater probably wouldn't be listening to um, SATCOM all that much, 
Uh, and this is a holdover from the days before we had SATCOM and there were no HF radios installed, so this pin was empty. So you might as well pull it and use it as that kind of um, tactile aid to know where your your hands are reaching down to. Uh, and once you got a little bit of experience, you could just kind of know from muscle memory. So you could push that in and you'd kind of know what you were instantly where your hands were anyway. So if, again, if that pin is out, you cannot hear that radio. Um, and that is a way, so when not, like all four radios are going off at once, you would want to, if you want to kind of focus in on one conversation, you would pull the pin to that radio and then you couldn't hear it anymore. So that helps you isolate the, the jibber jabber. If your less seater is talking on radio one and five and you're trying to talk to your wingman on uniform, um, you might be stepping all over each other. So you could temporarily pull these pins so that you can isolate the radios and, you know, say what you got to say and listen to what you got to listen to and then push them back in. A good, a good pilot will have all those radios in. Your brain just kind of learns to uh, sort of interpolate and extract and hear what it needs to hear at the moment. It can be very confusing and sometimes you just got to pull them. All right, to the next to that is the, uh, these are called the NAV uh, volume switches. So if we had an NDB installed, this would control the the volume for the NDB. So radio or nav B and A. Uh, B is not functional anymore. There's nothing connected to it. Um, nav A is now repurposed to be the CMOS common missile warning system uh, volume control. So that's all that does. Okay. All right, then moving on. So this, these are some kind of key features here. Uh, if your select switch is in the hot mic position, your mic is always on, which is super annoying. So we would typically want to turn it to Vox, which is voice activated. In normal, you have to press your uh, radio trigger to the first detent for ICS. It, this is a two position switch. So the first detent, second detent. First detent is always ICS or inside the cockpit. If you push it all the way in, that's when you transmit on that radio. Um, in normal, you do not have Vox. So in order to talk to your co-pilot, you would have to press your uh, cyclic switch to the first detent position to, to, to be able to talk to him. And if you turn it to ICS off, you don't hear anything at all. So normally we would have it in Vox. All right, this is a key switch right here. So in private, you are um, just talking to yourself, basically. Uh, in ICS, uh, only ICS works. So no matter what you do, if you uh, depress your cyclic radio trigger uh, to transmit, you're not transmitting because you don't have a radio selected. So on the left seat, um, where we don't have a remote function, the CPO, whenever he wants to talk on a certain radio, has to move that switch to the radio he wants to talk on. That's different in the right seat where we have this nifty feature on the uh, collective control head. There's two radio buttons here, uh, and I'll talk about these more in a minute. But in order to make these radio buttons work, I have to have this switch in the remote position. So in remote, that transfers control of my radio channel select and radio select features to my collective. So this is a key feature because the pilot does not want to have to take his hands off the controls in order to select a radio every time he wants to talk on a different radio. And we switched constantly. You'll have one sentence on an FM and then you'll go to the another radio to, to say another sentence or talk to somebody else. So radio switching was constant and always. Anyway, um, this switch must be in the remote position in order to enable this remote feature on the on the uh, pilot's collective control head. The uh, the mic switch is for two different types of uh, microphones in your helmet. So there's a uh, I forget what they're called. Number two is for a Tempest mic, which we did not have, and number one was for kind of a radio uh, a standard microphone, which we did have. Um, so we always made sure this was in um, in number one position. So on the run-up, I would want to make sure that my pins are set as desired and make sure that I'm in the remote position. So that's something I'll, 
I'll check when I when I do the run up. Go into the pilot's control head now to talk about this feature. Uh, with my switch in the remote position, I can s control which radios I'm selecting with this button right here. So FM1, UHF, VHF, SATCOM, and then this is usually worn off. There's a five in the center where when you press straight down on it, it selects radio number five. So if you press one, you select FM number one. And what you would see here with battery power applied is a little arrow indicating what the right side of the cockpit is listening to. Conversely, on the left side, you'd see a little arrow for what whatever radio the left seater has selected. Okay, so that's a pretty nice feature. Then I can also channel up or channel down uh, on in those radios for whichever one I have selected. So if I have UHF selected and I channel up, channel down, it does that on that radio. The keyboard uh, selection, when I press this to the left, it activates my keyboard. So if you are on a page where there's some data entry, so in other words, if I'm entering an, a, a new waypoint and um, or more appropriate, I guess, would be a uh, if I want to manually input a frequency. I could bring up a COM page. I press keyboard, and then my keyboard is active, and I can enter data there. Basically, it puts a cursor on whatever selection I have selected, and without pressing that selection manually, I can just activate the keyboard remotely from right here. Frequency, whenever I press that, it brings up, it automatically puts whatever radio I have it changes it to the manual frequency and activates the keyboard. So if I am on FM and I press frequency, um, it puts it in a manual frequency, and then I can enter a frequency number, hit enter, um, and the radio is, is set to that frequency. So pretty nice feature. All right, uh, let's see. Can we see it from here? No, I'll go back to the left seat. Okay, below that, is the SATCOM uh, control head or control indicator. So this is the ARC-231 SATCOM radio, and this is the ARC-231 SATCOM uh, fill port. So this is a cable that would be connected in order to load secure encryption protocols into the SATCOM radio. This is a kind of a separate radio that is not integrated into the aircraft software. Um, so it was a later addition that that needs its own separate uh, displays. All the other radios are managed through the MFDs. Uh, and then below that, I have the CMOS uh, control head. So this is the ties in with the control indicator up here. This is kind of like the uh, the on-off switch for it. So safe arm and then auto and bypass, really that's all that does here. Uh, I forgot to talk about, well, I haven't talked about the collective yet. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, and then finally, this is the ignition key. Um, so that can be on or off, okay? And then my collective, obviously. So moving on to the collective. Uh, I've already talked about the radio switches. My start switch is a is spring loaded to the off position to start the aircraft. Uh, I would hold it uh, for a minimum of two seconds to the on position, and then that tells FADEC to go ahead and start the aircraft. Uh, my jettison is my CMOS bucket jettison. So if I flip that cover up and press that button, it's going to pop off all the remaining flares in the bucket. So that's when you see those uh, videos on YouTube where they're doing a, a mass dispense, they probably just jettisoned the bucket and it just punches them all off. That You would do that in an emergency. Um, this little button right here that's not labeled is the laser on off switch for the AIM-2 laser, which is a small handheld uh, personal weapon laser that you would see mounted on a 50 cal, for instance, on a Humvee. It's the same laser. Uh, it's only NVG visible, and it is strapped to our M3P or the 50 cal. And when you press that switch, it turns the laser on, and you see a dot at a thousand meters for bore sighted to where the rounds should be hitting. 
it has no uh, interaction with the MMS. So it is strictly just strapped to the 50 cal and when you when you turn that laser on it'll just show you where your round should be impacting at a thousand meters or so. Um, other stuff on the control head here. My searchlight or landing, correctly known as the landing light, uh, there's it should be a three position switch. This is something we will have to implement right now. It is only a two position switch, so it should have a middle position for MVG. So it's a it's a two uh, two facing light basically. It's underneath the nose of the aircraft. Uh, in the normal position, the white light when it's stowed is pointed straight down and it's flush against the skin of the aircraft. Um, if I move, this is the the control for it. So left, right extend and retract so in order to move that light forward out in front of me like a headlight I would press forward on extend it takes about five seconds and then I can manipulate the light to go left or right uh, with this China hat switch and if I want to stow it again I just hold retract and about 12 seconds is what it takes to retract it back into the flush position that's a visible white light I also have an MVG feature so I would need to hold it left or right to rotate it from facing to the white light side, on the opposite side is the MVG visible light. So that is an IR light um, that is not visible to the naked eye, uh, and it puts out a light that uh, illuminates an area under goggles. So it works the same way as the white light. You just have to rotate it around. Um, you can think of it as like a fist. Rotate your fist around your arm when you hold left or right, and rotate your fist around on your wrist. Uh, it's kind of exactly the same thing. I see here I forgot to talk about the remote ICS switch. This is for there's an ex external communication port on the uh, on the ex the outside of the aircraft um, that a ground personnel crew member could hook a headset up to. Uh, if I want to talk to that crew member, I would turn this on and then I could talk to that guy. Typically, we didn't use those. We use hand and arm signals to talk to guys in the FARP. So I would just hold up a knee board that says I need seven rockets HE and 300 rounds of 50 cal and they'd give me a thumbs up and get to work. Uh, we didn't really bother with trying to hook up a cable because they would just have to unhook it and they're moving around so much they don't want to be constrained by a cable anyway. If detailed coordination had to take place then yeah they could hook that cable up but normally it's a quick in and out pit stop. We didn't bother with it. All right that's the uh, the collective. Um, oh uh, Tying back into SCAS and like an autopilot. Uh, this is for heading hold. So not a true autopilot like I was saying, but uh, we do have a heading hold feature. So you still have to maintain altitude with your own power setting. But if you engage the heading hold by pressing this button forward, uh, it tells the SCAS to maintain whatever heading you were at whenever you engaged it. Conversely, disengage just bumps it off, and then you can um, beep it left or right uh, by pressing that switch. So engage heading hold, and then you can beep it right, and the nose of the helicopter would turn, I believe it was one degree per second, pretty slow. So if you wanted to sit in a hover hold and not have to uh, keep using the pedals to maintain your heading, you could just engage heading hold. It wasn't that great because uh, it kind of hunted so if you started to turn if it was even remotely windy it kind of had a positive feedback loop so the nose of the helicopter would turn it would sense it it would put a correction in it would be a little too much correction so it would go too far the other way then it would just start bobbing back and forth so inevitably we always ended up turning it off because you kind of do this oscillation that was just super annoying unless the wind conditions were um, pretty calm all right and last uh, well, not last. Let me get to this too. Uh, this switch right here is the uh, engine speed setting. So it's called the RPM trim. So on run-up, uh, after you get the throttle full open, typically your RPM stabilizes at about 98-99%. Operating RPM is 100 to 101. So I would use this uh, switch to set my NP, as we talked about, to 100. So this would show green at 100 and the way these vertical scales work it's a little counterintuitive they don't 
show that vertical scale until you've reached that number. So 100 actually looks like the chiclet between 100 and 101 because that chiclet will not illuminate until you reach 100. So in order to set 100% rotor RPM, you actually have to go to what appears to be 101. So this is the green band, 97 to 100, but uh, the way the software is designed is it doesn't illuminate until you are at 101 is what it looks like. So this will show a green band at 100 and this will be blank from below because what happens is it goes green and then it once you go into the next operating band, which would be the caution band, this is actually one yellow chick chiclet that should be displayed. That would be normal. And I'll, I'll show that when we get to that. All right, what else here? Oh, uh, the throttle. So this is a twist grip, kind of old school. Uh, most modern helicopters now have throttle control levers. For instance, the Blackhawk. Uh, has two throttle control levers that are up on the overhead. The Apache has two throttle control levers uh, in the back and the front seat that are kind of on the left side of the cockpit uh, that look like your, your standard airline pilot um, throttle controls. We control the throttle with this uh, twist grip. This is the idle release button, uh, and this is important. So watch what happens when I open the throttle. It's going to pop out at idle, and now I can't rotate that throttle back beyond uh, all the way to the closed position. The reason I want that is to prevent inadvertent shutdown of the engine, uh, for instance, when I'm doing auto practice auto rotations. So from full open, if I want to bring the engine to idle, I just hit the, the idle detent. I want to know that my idle detent is working, so I test this on run up. Uh, so I bring the throttle open, hit the idle detent, then press the idle detent release, and then I can close that throttle. I'll go ahead and talk about these marks right now. Um, there's an emergency procedure relating to the failure of the FADEX system, the Full Authority Digital Engine Controller, uh, which if that computer fails, there's now no longer um, any computer controlling how much fuel the engine gets. So then it reverts to a manual condition. Or you can take the FADEC auto, auto manual switch to manual as part of that emergency procedure to take control of how much fuel the engine gets. Uh, and that's actually part of the emergency response is to press that button and put it in manual control. But depending on how where this twist grip is set, you may be putting in way too much fuel for the conditions. And if you have that, then you're going to get overspeeds, massive yaw effects, and it, you could actually worsen or exacerbate whatever condition you're in, depending on uh, whether you're above ETL, below ETL, in a hover, etc. So when FADEC fails, you're going to get an audio, you're going to get a caution flag, and the immediate response is FADEC auto manual switch to manual, boom, I press that, and then throttle adjust to the mark. Okay, the mark is set by throttle position correlating to 75% mechanical fuel flow. Uh, so there's a cable that goes from this throttle back to the fuel control uh, lever and from there to the, uh, the fuel control unit um, in the engine compartment. If my throttle's full open, I'm getting somewhere between 450 to 480 pounds of gas per hour, which is about 120 more than it could ever use. So if you went to FADEC manual and did not adjust your throttle to 75% or so, uh, you would immediately get so much fuel that it would over temp, over torque, and basically wrench itself out of the sky before you could do anything about it. So you have about two seconds as the mechanical function comes in, you press that switch, you go to the manual mode, and you have two seconds to react to uh, set that switch. 75% mechanical throttle position correlates to about 300 pounds of fuel flow per hour, which is good for a hover, it's good for just about any cruise condition you could uh, want. So it sets you up 
when you go to the manual mode, you're in a survivable situation as far as how much fuel is going to the engine. It's not too much, it's not too little, and from there, you would have to manually, just like in the old Huey analog throttle days, as you raise the collective, you would have to add fuel, and as you lower the collective, you would have to take away fuel to always keep your RPMs at 100%. If you think about it, um, if you, whenever you raise collective, that's more power, so more fuel is required. If you were at a constant fuel state and you raise the collective without having a corresponding change in fuel delivery, your rotor would droop because it wouldn't be getting enough fuel to maintain the power setting. So in the manual mode, you have to, as you raise collective, you have to add fuel, and as you lower collective to keep the rotor from overspeeding as you get too much fuel, you have to lower that that fuel. And that's the constant uh, kind of finesse game if you have this type of failure to get the aircraft on the ground, and it's emergency procedure that we train. Okay, so at the conclusion of that, that throttle check, um, I would go ahead and press that idle detent, and we would close the throttle all the way again. All right, that is a once over the world of the cockpit. Let me just talk about the circuit breaker panels here real quick. This is a utility light, so you can turn that utility light on. It's on a uh, it's on a phone cable, basically. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, that squirrely cable. So you can just detach this thing, kind of hold it in your hand and use it as necessary. We, we all carried our own flashlights, so nobody ever really used that. Uh, this is called the aft center circuit breaker panel. And then the overhead aft circuit breaker panel, the forward overhead at, uh, circuit breaker panel. This is the emergency fuel cutoff handle. This is the free air temperature gauge. These little hooks right here is where we hung our helmets and other crap. Um, already talked about the cabs. Really, that's, that's all we have to talk about there. That light right there is controlled by these switches. This is our overhead light. Um, this is the aux or auxiliary circuit breaker panel. This switch right here controls the MVG formation lights, otherwise known as the slime lights. Those are only visible under NVGs. It's a five position switch, dim setting one to most bright at uh, five and then off. So really a six position switch. The IR beacon is a strobe on top of the aircraft that is again, only visible to NVGs. Um, Okay, that's it for the, the circuit breakers. I'll tell you what, uh, we are at about an hour. I'm going to stop this video, and then we will go through the, the detailed run-up here um, in the second part of this. So I'll go ahead and stop it now.